Let us pray. Lord, thank you so much for you. Be with us now. Let us feel your presence. Let us feel your peace. Let us feel your hope. Let us feel your renewal. Let us feel you. Lord, we thank you and we love you so much. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Absolutely honored to be here. Uh, it's a little different from California. <laughs> and I'm from the Midwest. You know, I'm from Kansas City. And so when I got, thank you, I see that one, thanks. <laughs> and so when I got the invitation, it was like, oh, it's like going home. But you know what? It was 80 degrees in, in, in California. And um, the time is different. And I had to go through the airport. And I was in the airport yesterday. My plane was to leave at 155. And then it didn't go at 155. And then they announced, well, it's on its way. It's on its way. And then when it got there, they said, oh, it's broken. <laughs> and that's when you look for God all over again. <laughs> like, Lord, let it stay broken. Don't let them have fix it. And so finally, they canceled the plane and said, we got another one. And by that time, well, anyway, I got here. And we thank God for that. Absolutely honest. Scott, thank you for the introduction. Emily, thank you for the scripture. And I just want to talk to you briefly today about surviving the day after yesterday. You know, I, I recounted the little LAX experience I had, but I cannot complain. If you watch the news on Friday of this past week, uh, a man decided it was in his right and well-being to come and shoot up the airport, Terminal 3. People who were just going home are coming to visit Mickey Mouse at Disneyland, are just traveling through an airport to get to a final destination, and their lives were changed forever. Some killed, some maimed, some still in the hospital, some lives interrupted. And we've seen it over and over again in our own lives, in the lives of our country and the lives of other countries. It's amazing how one day you can get up as business as usual and then all of a sudden in a moment in a twinkling of an eye, things change. Do you all know what I'm talking about? You get that phone call that someone you love has died. You go to work and discover that the job you loved or you didn't like and you had either way, they don't want you, don't need you, or can't afford you anymore. And you find yourself unemployed. You find that all the things you've been taught in life did not add up to what you needed to, to be who you needed to be, to survive whatever you were going through. And it's not just about those disasters and those travesties. travesties. Sometimes it's simply about being. It's nothing like, waking up and enduring one day and coming to a new mindset about something. Let me give you an example in case you're wondering where is she going with this. Have you ever been in love? And if you're in love with the person next to you and you haven't told them yet, just blink, wink, you know. <laughs> but it's nothing like waking up and realizing that you love this person more than they love you or that they don't love you at all or you decide that you don't want to be in a relationship you're in anymore and you don't know what to do or you're married and you realize you don't want to be married or you're married and you do want to be married and the one married to you don't want to be married and they've told you that day you deal with it almost but when you wake up that next day, when reality sets in, it's a whole nother day of pain. How do you deal with that reality when you don't want to go on? I am in a situation now where one of my, uh, one of my closest friends in the world, her son um, decided he didn't want to be in his marriage anymore. And the wife going to church, because we do that, decided it was okay and he was, she was going to forgive him and work it out. Well, somewhere the light switched when she realized that he is not going to stay. And now we're asking questions like, is there any guns in the house? She has torn up what? She has destroyed what? And I do not fault her. For her, her life has fallen apart. And in her own words, 
I don't know how I can live without him. Surviving the day after yesterday. Such was the case with Jeremiah. Jeremiah was in a precarious situation because his world was falling apart again. And not just falling apart, literally destroyed. There was no home to go back to. But Jeremiah was in a case, and, and, and we would say now that Jeremiah was in a funk. If we, if we, if, if we are psychologists, we would probably say he was manic. Okay, if we were on the street, we would say the dude got issues. <laughs> if we were singing music, we would say he is heavy into the blues. You have turned my bitterness to God. God, you have made me not only a laughing stock, you have made me a target of you. I mean, how depressed is that? I'm so down, God, my up is low. Just down. And so, and Jeremiah has every right to be. Jeremiah, listen, do y'all read the Bible? <laughs> so you know Jeremiah, and if we go back to Jeremiah 1, Jeremiah gets called by God to do something he didn't even want to do in the first place. And then so he stood on that, I'm too young. And God said, don't tell me you're too young. I got you, and, and I will take care of you, and I will rescue you. I will rescue, excuse me? Have you ever been called to a ministry and God said, I'll rescue you? <laughs> in order to be rescued, you have to be what? Exactly, in trouble. You are called to a ministry of trouble. Try to explain that. And then God's going to say, I will call, you will tear down, you will build up, you will da 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 da. And none of those things we sign up for. As preachers, as ministers, it's the same thing. Some of you all are in situations right now that you won't even talk about because you think it's just a dream. But it's the reality. And in Jeremiah's world, it was reality that he struggled with because his life wasn't easy. And so to make it harder, God did things like, Jeremiah, don't get married. And I'm sure Jeremiah went Scooby-Doo. <laughs> I'm Jewish. I'm a priest. I got to have a woman. Don't get married. Don't have children. Now, Jeremiah. So here Jeremiah is set up to be weird. And not just weird. Now, Jeremiah, I want you to go to the potter's house. Jeremiah, I want you to get the fig. Jeremiah, I want you to make a yoke. Jeremiah, I want you to go back to the potter house. I want you to get some ceramic, really pretty stuff. Preach and then break it on the ground. All of this. And somehow, Jeremiah just got to the point that he couldn't take it anymore. Before we get to Lamentations, Jeremiah was considered that prophet of warning and lamentations, that word of warning. Because before we got here, you saw little hints of Jeremiah's angst when he says, you know what, I just got so mad and I decided I wasn't going to preach anymore. I was not going to give you another word from God. And we know the passage where he says, and then yet it was like fire shut up in my bones. So Jeremiah in himself has this angst. Why? Because he's human. And so in that, he has a people who are in trouble, a people who had been taken and carried off to Babylon because they had disobeyed God. They had gone against God's word. And God kept saying, repent. God kept saying, come back to me. God kept saying, if you don't. God said, I'm a jealous lover. And yet they could not get it right. And so here, as he writes this, Babylon has taken captivity. The best of the best were taken in. The city, the temple was destroyed. Jeremiah's own future looked bleak, and he was in pain. His people was in pain. In fact, Dr. Mignon Jacob says that this passage and these words are words when you're in a place where there are no other words. These are the words that would be uttered at a funeral. These were considered funeral dirges when it hurt so bad that there's nothing more. Sometimes we get what we deserve. Other times we find ourselves in situations that had none of us in it, nothing we've done wrong, and yet we find ourselves at the same place. Well, here we can learn some lessons from Jeremiah as we struggle to deal with and survive our own days after yesterday's. First, as Jeremiah model, he models that whole idea that we must learn to be introspective. Introspective. 
One thing I find that sometimes frustrates me about us as Christians is the fact that sometimes we don't always have a clear grasp of reality. We could be walking down the street with our head in our hand and broken from the neck going, it's going to be okay. And we've learned that. Just have faith. But every now and then, you've got to be honest and own your stuff. As Christians, we don't talk a lot about being feeling deceived by God. We don't talk a lot about how God has disappointed me. But here you have Jeremiah being honest. God, you've set me up. Lord, you're the one piercing me. Lord, you are the one hurting me. Lord, you are the one. And it's not blasphemous. I was always taught you never question God. But Job teaches us that God can handle the questions. And so here he reflects. And we've got to be honest. We've got to start being honest with what we think, what we feel about what it is that's in us. I'll never forget when my sister died at 34, just graduating from law school, just being married the year before, having her first son. My sister died three weeks later. And I remember asking God this very point blankly, Lord, did you consider me at all when you let her die or were you just being God? The question scared me because I felt like if I demonstrated being mad at God, that God would leave me. But the only way you can deal with your issues, if you honestly deal with what is causing your pain, that intro, what do you really feel? What do you really think? God, let's talk about it because God can handle it. And Jeremiah understood that. And he says, you just turned my bitterness to God. You have hurt me from the inside out. You have hurt me. So many of us are in relationships where we're fighting all the time because we simply won't deal with what the real issue is. Every now and then, I accidentally watch TV. <laughs> and there was a show on the OWN network, I Gotta Fix My Life. And if y'all, come on, if y'all watch it, just one finger, one finger up. <laughs> And, and, and the whole premise is, Ayana comes, she visits, she sits with the whole family, or she sits with who's ever involved to try to figure out what the tr real truth is. And one of her saying is, you've saying is, you've got to own up to the truth, and you've got to tell me the truth. Because if you don't tell me the truth, I'll be helping you fix a lie. What she was saying is, you need to go inside, deal with what's really going on, and then we can work it out. And so this is Jeremiah introspectively saying, I've got to take a look at this. But the caution with this is that when you go in there, you cannot stay in there and don't build your home there. What theologian says is sometimes we're so down for so long that we end up staring at our own belly button. You can't stay there. You can go there. You must go there. But you can't reside there. You cannot let your pain hold the rest of your life hostage. Jeremiah could not stay down. He got down, and that's the reality. But he couldn't stay there. Familiar misery compels us. This is better. It's better to hurt this way than to hurt another way. But the invitation is to just be introspective. Take a look at it. Own it. And then Jeremiah does the second movement. He says, when I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall, I remember them and my soul is downcast within me. And yet when I think about it, hmm, I have hope. Introspective. And then you must be retrospective. Every now and then, the invitation when you are in a life, when you can't figure out what to do, you've got to remember all those other times you were in a life and you couldn't figure out what to do. How did you get out? Who was that? And you will look at the very core of that. God was somewhere around dancing, working out what was going on in you. And when you look at Jeremiah's remembrance, he had a great memory. Jeremiah remembered his people and how God from Abraham called them to be. And how even as they walked, even as Abraham walked, even when we get to the children, Esau and Jacob, even when we get to Jacob and his children, even when we get to Joseph and his whole thing of brothers being jealous and him being in captivity and him hanging out with Potiphar and then Potiphar's wife decides that he wants, she wants him because he was fine. <laughs> 
Are y'all still with me? <laughs> Catch up. So him trying to live a righteous life, he ends up in prison, accused of rape. And when he's in prison, the only dream he has left is his gift to dream and his ability to interpret them. Two people have dreams. He interprets both. One, you're going to get your head cut off. The other, you're going to live and go back to the key. And it came true. The king had a dream. No one could interpret it. The one remembers. Joseph can. Joseph interprets the dream. Now Joseph is put in a situation where he goes from prison to prince, second in the kingdom. This is part of Jeremiah's history. And a people enslaved were saved, coming out 400 years later, more than they were when they came in, strong and visceral and willing to serve God the best they could. Jeremiah remembered how they went through all those things, how they've been taken up and how God showed up every time. And then Jeremiah remembered his own life and how he was called by God to preach and constantly persecuted. God was giving him a word, and there were other preachers preaching a different word. He would say, repent. They would say, all is it well in Zion, and he would be in trouble. He was mocked. He was persecuted. He was made fun of. He was put in the mire and the clay. He was yoked. His, his own people turned on him. And he says, I remember. I remember it all. But this is what I remember. Because of God's great love, none of it consumed me. Even to the point that my splendor was gone, it was not consumed. Why? Because God loves me. In your own life, has God done anything for you? Some of you are here just because of the grace of God. Most of you, all of you are here. All of us are here. Because of God's grace. You don't get to a, through a D-men program or in a D-men program because you woke up one day. <laughs> I'm in, I'm out, I'm in, I'm out. No, I'm in. No. You don't get to be pastors because you just willed it. You don't survive those heartaches and those breakups and those disappointments because it's in you. You don't pay those bills when you have no money and yet somehow they get paid. All of that is God. And he remembers, retrospectively, he remembers, he remembers all that God has done through the good times and the bad times. He remembers, but even as you are retrospective, let me remind you again, you cannot just stay there because you cannot let your past hold your future hostage. Many of us sit up and talk and we're mad about these days and we wish for the good old days. Well, we were the good old days that good. We always think it's better. Oh, gosh, I hear people say, oh, to be 16 again. I don't ever want to be 16 again. <laughs> I'm glad I got alive the first time. You know, I don't want to go back. But we tend to fantasize about those things. It always amazes me as pastors, whenever you come into a new pastorate, they always love the old one. I'll let you catch up again. <laughs> Reverend so-and-so didn't do it that way. Pastor so-and-so didn't do that way. I wish you were more like Pastor Bob. Well, what happened to Pastor Bob? We ran him out. <laughs> you know, and so we, we do. We want to stay at that, that place of, of remembering, but you cannot stay there. Why? Because God always has more. And so Jeremiah takes that third moon. He said, this is our call to mind, and therefore I have hope that if it was not for God's great love for me, I would be consumed. But his mercies are new every morning. God, great is your faithfulness. How did he get from you have turned my bitterness to gall to, gall, to God, great is your faithfulness? After his introspective, as his introspectiveness, his retrospectiveness, then all of a sudden, somewhere, he got a new perspective. Yes, it's bad, but God is good. Yes, I'm hurting, but God is faithful. In essence, he had that but God moment. But God. But God, I, this would destroy me, but God, 
Jeremiah remembered. Jeremiah remembered when he had to prophesy to a people who were in pain, in captivity, who were planning to escape out, and he had to give them a word. He said, live. Pray for the city. Pray for the people. For when the people prosper, you will prosper. In 29, he goes on to say, you're going to be in captivity for 70 years, but don't worry because God says this, I know the plans I have for you that promise you a future and a hope. A future meaning that you will not end it here, it will not end here, and a hope that all that within you that you are wishing, desiring, building your legacy, all of that is intact. Jeremiah remembered. And therefore, he got a new perspective. So he goes from singing his dirges and his blueses to singing his praises for God. He goes from to it's hard to write that one down, so that's what to say it. But he made that movement because he saw a new vision. He got a new perspective, a but God perspective. And then it's almost like he begins to sing, great is thy faithfulness, O Lord. And you must understand the understanding of new mercies. We talk about grace. Great is us not, grace is us getting what we, de what we deserve. Let's see, let, me, let me fix that. Grace is us getting what we don't deserve. Mercy is us not getting what we do deserve. Let me say it again. Grace is us getting what we don't deserve. Mercy is us not getting what we do deserve. And he says, Lord, when I think about it, you have not given us what we really deserve. I might be in pain, but I really probably deserve more. And then he says, and when I look back, you are so faithful, God. You always show up and you always show out. Lord, great is your faithfulness. New mercies. Shower in them. I think about my son. My sister died. She left my nephew, who I adore, Faluke. His name, they named him the night before she died, is Yoruba for placed in the hands of God. And so I would keep uh, Faluke most weekends. When he was about four, um, he was with me one Saturday night. And usually I would come in from church because we had Saturday church uh, with the youth. And I would throw him in the bath and just kind of let him play. I was so exhausted. I was like, tonight he gets introduced to a shower. So I turned the shower on and he looked at me like, Auntie, this is not the right ritual. I didn't realize he had never taken a shower. So I put him in a bathtub and I pulled the curtain and I sat there and I heard nothing. I opened the curtain, he stood there frozen. I said, Luke, it's okay, it's water. Close the curtain back and then all of a sudden I hear a, Choo -choo! a sprinkle, a splatter. Then I heard a, <laughs> <laughs> and then all of a sudden you just hear all this laughing and look in the boy is dancing in the water, just, just having so much fun. And so, and I kept thinking, I wonder, do you remember your first shower? And so then as I took him out and wrapped a towel around him, he lunges into me, soaking wet, hugs me and goes, oh, auntie, can we do it again in the morning? And I thought about that thing. And when I think about it here, I think because God's mercies are new every morning, that's what God wants for us. Every day to just dance in it. And every night hug God around the neck and say, Lord, can we do it again in the morning? When was the last time you celebrated the new mercies? They don't run out. And even if you have some left over, you get new ones. <laughs> every morning. Every morning, new mercies. God, great is your perspective. Great is your mercies. We've got to change our perspective and quit looking at us and somehow transfer to look at God. When we feel like we can't get through it the day after, understand God has gotten us through all the day afters and all the days to come. This God, this God, Lord, great is thy mercies. Tyler Perry is one of my favorite controversial, but he's an artist, he'll write, he's a writer. Many of you all don't know that Tyler Perry was homeless at one point, lived in his car. Some years ago, he signed a contract with TVS for $100 million. 
In fact, he made a list of young people headed toward billionairehood. And he's single. And I said, Lord, I'm single. New mercies. So Oprah is, is one of his best friends. I mean, he's walking in big circles. And yet he tells the story before he wrote the movie, The Family That Prays. He found himself so depressed he didn't know what to do. And I'm thinking, how could you be depressed? You used to live in a car, now you live in a mansion. Hmm. But he heard a song by Leanne Womack, I Hope You Dance. And the words are simple. I hope you will always feel small when you stand near an ocean. I hope that as doors close, more will open. And I hope you will give faith a chance. And when you get the chance to dance, I hope you dance. I hope you dance. And he said the invitation to see life anew, to see a new perspective, and to celebrate that is what got him out of his depression, just like Jeremiah. That introspective, that respect, that introspective, and then that retrospective, and understanding that in the new perspective, God always extends the invitation that every morning he will show up with new mercies. Every day God will be faithful. And the invitation I extend to you is that as you get your new perspective, when life deals you hard blows, when you can't figure out which way to go, that you will remember God and God's faithfulness. And when you get a chance to sit it out or dance, just like my nephew, I hope you dance. <laughs>